kind of kick off the show here. <laughs> We're in green! Up. Man, Bill's Mafia, welcome to the Mafia cast. We are Live today, I am live from Lubbock, Texas. I'm in my mom's house doing a little traveling. How are you guys doing? Not traveling. Same old. <laughs> Go to work. Come home. Do podcasts. We've, we've got the one and only Joe Miller with us today. Thank you, Joe. How are you doing? Good. I'll be uh, traveling to Phoenix, Arizona on Tuesday for work. Not super excited about that, but uh, yeah, traveling nonetheless. But but my job requires... I was in Toronto yesterday. My job requires me to travel a lot, so... Mm. Well, good. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Doing. I don't think I envy you in the traveling. Um, didn't go so well for me on this one. I uh, I couldn't even get out of Boise for like two hours late on that. Well, the problem is you and, went to uh, Boise. No, I'm leaving. I was leaving Boise. <laughs> oh, gotcha. My bad. <laughs> what are you doing in Boise? Don't go to Boise. Don't stay there. Go someplace else. But, yeah. uh, that's where I live. We've been that's, trying that's... to get him to move out this way, but <laughs> I don't think it's happening. Yeah, Boise times. is. Boise is home. No, but my, my flight was delayed two hours. And the funny thing is, is the flight, the plane was late getting to the airport in the first place. And then they got there and then they come out and they announce over the, their PA system mechanical issues because the, apparently the laboratory, as they refer to it, was clogged. <laughs> all right. All right. So I was like, we don't want to hear all the details about that. <laughs> At least you aren't the guy that. Uh, but at any rate. Old? What was yeah. the story a couple months ago where the guy like went to the bathroom on the airplane before it took off and like clogged the toilet and then the plane couldn't take off. So they had to like deplane and like fix the plane because oh he broke, broke the toilet. <laughs> but yeah, so I travel, I travel a bunch. I, uh, I don't mind it. I, I don't mind it, believe it or not. Um, when I took the job, I knew that it would travel and I was kind of concerned about how much it was. And now that I am traveling, it's actually, I'm kind of enjoying it. So at my age, but yeah, but yeah, it's, it's fun, but it can be a pain in the butt. So especially if you're coming home from Mexico on American airlines, I don't recommend anybody do that. Six for six. They've never gotten us home on time. They've always oh, stranded right. us, canceled us something next day, six for six. Yeah, it's bad. Noted, noted. Yeah, American airlines. I flew on Delta. Mm. We, I eventually got to Atlanta, so I was being, I went to Atlanta, and then from Atlanta, I was supposed to go to Panama City. That flight obviously had already taken off before I got there. So my daughter, who lives in Panama City, I was going to get her and my mm -hmm. granddaughter, and they're moving back to Idaho. So she picks me up at the airport. She drives five hours from Panama City to Atlanta, picks me up, and we just jumped in the car and immediately started towards home. So the first 17 hours through the night, we drove and we drove. And now we're, you know, making the stop at my mom's house. So it worked out. We got where we were kind of going and stuff. But um, I, I don't recommend ever stopping in Atlanta for gas or anything. Just drive right on through that, that city. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I was concerned when we stopped that we might die. But we just <laughs> we wow. got out of there. <laughs> there was some shady stuff um, at the gas station. And I was... I, I won't go into the whole the, story, but I think you went to the wrong gas station, bro. Yeah. That was probably wrong part of town for sure. <laughs> uh, we were standing there. I was. She went inside to change the baby's diaper, and um, and I was sitting in the car. We were filled up and ready to go. And this lady comes up to the side of the car, starts knocking on the window. This one was completely coked out or on something. There was no question. Mm. She's like, "Roll down your window. Roll down your." Window. I was like, "Uh, uh, I'm not rolling my window <laughs> down. You're crazy." <laughs> See ya. <laughs> But anyways, let's move on. Um, we're here to talk Buffalo Bills, so let's do that. And for, I, I mean, I know the season didn't end well, obviously. We won't get into too much of that. But here we are with the uh, free agencies kind of, I would say we're post-free agency at this point. There might be some more signings. There was one today, in fact. But before we get too much further into that, Mike, you want to you wanna play our, our thing for our, our sponsors? Yeah. Here's a little radio spot for our buddy John over at Game On Video Games and Sports Memorabilia. 
Hey, it's John from Game On Sports Memorabilia. Check out our huge selection of unopened wax boxes of Pokemon cards. You have to see our selection of over 2 million sports cards in stock, plus hard-to-find card supplies. And if you have anything to sell, bring it in. We can help you determine the true value before you sell it. We pay fair market value every day. It's Game On Sports Memorabilia, 2670 Dewey Avenue in Greece. Check out our podcast for news and information on the card and collectible universe. Also, check out our Facebook page. For more, call 481-2153. That's 481-2153. That's our sponsor over at Game On Sports. They're fantastic people. Do some great things over there. Got some great memorabilia. And again, it's not just Bill's stuff. So whatever sport you're into, whatever hobby you're into, well, I won't say whatever hobby. That could be dangerous. But they've got a lot of neat stuff over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, let's just kind of jump into um, the whole free agency bit. Uh, of course, we were welcoming Joe Miller to the show, and uh, I saw kind of a back and forth between you and, and Spence, I guess a week or so ago, about Curtis Samuel uh, signing, I believe. So I kind of that's what spurred me to, to reach out to you and see if you wanted to come on the show today and, and talk about that, and you know, among some other things. But let's start there. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on Curtis Samuel? What Curtis Samuel is a nice player. Uh, it's funny because this uh, <laughs> I went to the the live recording of the Shout podcast with Matt Perino and Ryan Talbot, and Perino was like, "You're coming on the show." I was like, "Bro, I didn't come here to be on your show." He goes, "You're coming." You, he goes, "That take about Curtis Samuel was hot," and I'm like, "I don't think it was that hot." He goes, "It was hot," and I'm like, uh, "Okay." So I tweet out effectively that you know basically the Curtis Samuel signing just gives me Jamison Crowder vibes, and it, I'm not I wasn't saying that Jamison Crowder and Curtis Samuel are the same player. I wasn't saying like oh they've had the same career. I was it just had a very kind of like I feel like we've been down this road. We're gonna go find a guy right that hasn't really overachieved. He's kind of underachieved. He's got some talent. He's got some elusiveness. We're trying to fill that Cole Beasley void. And basically, there's some injury history somewhat on both sides, not as much on Curtis Samuel's side as we kind of think there is. Um, but effectively, that's all the take was, is I just, it's just giving me kind of like Jamison Crowder vibes. And man, people lost their minds. Like people were like, <laughs> how dare you say that Curtis Samuel is Jamison Crowder? But if you remember when we signed Jamison Crowder, Twitter kind of lit up the same way that it did when we signed Curtis Samuel, which goes back to the current, like the Jamison Crowder vibes. Right. Um, I like Curtis Samuel. I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for what the bills are trying to accomplish in our minds, in our collective minds. I don't know that that's necessarily what the bills are at the end of the day, trying to accomplish, you know, the Buffalo bills have been trying to replace Cole Beasley since Cole Beasley left the first time to include bringing back Cole Beasley to replace Cole Beasley. <laughs> and they didn't take yeah. him off the bench. They left him on the bench and it was like, well, we're going to save him for the playoffs. Right. And then like the playoffs come and he's still on the pine. Meanwhile, we're missing that key piece that, that Cole Beasley guy to move the ball and always be there two, three yards down the field. A guy that sees the field, the way that the Josh Allen, does. I mean, as much as we give, uh, uh, Stefan Diggs, the credit for kind of unleashing Josh Allen 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever he's become. Cole Beasley might be more about it than Stefan Diggs was because Cole saw the field the way that Josh sees the field. So Josh just always knew where Cole was going to be. And he was that outlet guy and he just kept the sticks moving. He was sure handed. He could catch the football. He could get open. Samuel presents and brings a lot of the same intangibles intangibles as far as that goes whether or not he is going to be cole beasley and i would say it this way whether or not the bills are going to use him right the way that they yeah. used cole beasley remains to be seen the funny part and i'm long winded i apologize i haven't done a show in forever um <laughs> all good all good the thing that remains to be seen and, and i say this often to people and i've done it on twitter as well you know, everybody's excited about the 2023 Bills offense and how we got the run game involved. And look at, you know, James Cook. And I love James Cook. And everybody loves James Cook. And, you know, who knows what the 2024 offense is going to look like. And I'm always like, hang on a second. If you could have the 2023 offense or the 2020 offense, which one you take in? And everybody immediately goes 2020. It's like, yeah, there we are. There we are. Right? Mm. Yeah. What do you guys think, Casey? Mike? I don't think this dude has spoken yet. 
No. <laughs> Are you just a moderator? Are you yeah. here to like bleep out words? Because I don't swear generally. Dude, dude, I I'm dealing with some back problems right now, so like I'm trying to keep talking to a like not a minimum, but you know, I'm trying not to get too animated here. Yeah, my... trying to do his best um, just not to look grumpy. Yeah, he pretty, likes to give me crap high. about being old, but you know. <laughs> I got you. All down. I might have two of you stacked age wise. So I'm 50. I'll be 51 in June. So I'm old. I'm the youngest one on the show, but I swear to God, I'm the oldest one. I swear. <laughs> I swear. So you're not too I, much. I like older her to say so. you got me by two years. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right. That's right. See, Ronnie's still up there. Uh, I like Curtis Samuel. I liked him when he was down in Carolina. I mean, obviously, when he was with Joe Brady, he's never. Samuel's never played with a, a quarterback like Josh. I mean, I think they said that about Jameson Crowder. Agreed. <laughs> you know, they they did, but I also think that Curtis Samuel is a genu- generally better better player than Jameson Crowder is. Fair. Um, you know, he he can be the gadget guy that he we saw how much he when he played in Carolina, how much Joe Brady had him run. You know, Crowder was in there to yes, be the Cole Beasley guy, but. He wasn't there to bring the jet sweeps and the screens and uh, running the routes out of the backfield. Like I think they, they're, they're going to have Curtis Samuel do. I I would see Curtis Samuel as somewhere having somewhere like, I don't know, maybe 200 rushing yards this year mm-hmm. for us. Um, just, you know, off swing passes that, you know, just may maybe end up going like being counted as mm-hmm. a run right. instead of a pass. But I mean, he can play outside. He can play inside. Crowder was more of a uh, slot receiver. They expected to try to force him to be a slot receiver, and I think that they're going to have Samuel just kind of be a chess piece and move him all around the board. So I'm I I get what like the similarities that you definitely made. Not from, similarities, like, just vibes. The, all I yeah. said was yeah. vibes. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but the, the vibe similarities, like because because I get it. Like I thought, I mean, it was the same thing with Jamison Crowder, but I just think just the level of player that Curtis Samuel is compared. to Jameson Crowder. That's what has me a little bit more excited than it did when we signed Crowder. And I was happy when we signed him then. Mm. I, I'd agree. I'd say I'm I'm definitely more excited than than the Jameson Crowder signing. Um as far as vibes, now now I'm kind of getting Cole Beasley vibes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um but no, I, I like I like the idea, the versatility, uh being able to be part of the rushing attack, maybe moving around the field. Uh, and just the speed, you know, getting getting across the field and, and just getting to the open spot uh, for Josh, you know, to check down if he has to and, and be that guy that's there, like uh, like Joe kind of said. The interesting thing about it is that uh, everybody keeps touting and talking about the run ability. And another one is the bubble screen thing. And it's like the Bills don't run bubble screen wide receiver screens well. Like they don't nah. like and not. And we just we just let our best blocking wide receiver go. Like, <laughs> so we'll see what happens, but go ahead. But Sorry. he's another player on the field, you know, throw him in motion, you know, kind of distract people even uh, on the defense. So, yeah, I mean, it's a new, it's a new solid piece. And I mean, it's a, we didn't, I don't think we uh, expected to get a, a receiver Agreed. like him in, this year in, in free agency. 100%. So uh, it's definitely a pleasant surprise. 100%. I think we didn't we, run bubble screens as well. Well, we didn't run them well with Diggs, but right. we ran them well with Shakir. You couldn't catch them. Uh, well, that that's a big part <laughs> of the issue. Um, but it seemed like Diggs always just he was always going lateral when he when he when he would catch those passes. He was trying to like make everybody go by him, so then then he could take off. Shakir was would kind of bob and weave like work his way further upfield while doing that. Mm. Oh, and I, and I think that Curtis Samuel being a little bit uh, quicker of a player, they're kind of having the same thought process with, all right, so Shakir was able to do it. Let's get a guy that is a little bit smaller than Shakir, but quicker and faster and see how well he can do it. Yeah. I like it. Mm-hmm. My first question, because it's something that you said when you were talking about, we, we've been looking to replace Beasley since Beasley. Um, it, it, is Shakir that guy? Have we found that replacement in Shakir, do you think? Are you asking the Joe panel or are you asking me? All of you. Anyone. We'll, we'll start with you, Joe. <laughs> oh, I was going to somebody else go your for head. <laughs> Okay, we'll, 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 pan it. we'll go over to, let's start with uh, Mike on this one. 
I love Shakir. I think he's solid, but I, I don't think he's he's that maybe yet. Maybe further along in his career with more experience, he he could maybe be more reliable. It, I mean, in that sort of sense, I guess. Uh, I mean, he had the highest catch rate of re- any receiver in the league. That's yeah, pretty I mean, not to say yeah, he's not reliable, but uh, I don't know. It's hard to say because we've we've seen Cole Beasley. Uh, in his heyday, and then we've we've seen him, you know, with the last season he played for the Bills, which wasn't wasn't too impressive. Which I I don't know, it it wasn't all on him, but you know, uh, he had, what do you have a broken leg? He had broken ribs. He had yeah, like, he's dude he's all like banged broke. up. He so. was broken. <laughs> we're t- we're talking like I feel like there's different versions of Cole Beasley out there as well. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> right. I don't know. I'll go. I'll go next. I mean, it's, I like Shakir a lot as well. Um, I came into this season, 2023, kind of like with an expectation different than everybody else's. Everybody else's was like, he caught 10 passes. Make him the number two wide receiver. And it's like, can we wait a moment? Like, he caught 10 passes, and there's a reason that he wasn't necessarily on the field. But Shakir made himself a solid target and did a lot with his opportunities in 2023, and it was great to see him do that. Uh, he obviously is quicker on the field. So there's a big, there's a word that Bruce Nolan talks about verticality. So verticality isn't necessarily like straight line speed, just cause you're not super fast. Gabe Davis doesn't mean that you can't get vertical. Shakir kind of has that ability too to kind of get a by people and, and, and like use his football speed. It's, it, it's, it's tough for us as bills fans to always want to be like, well, he's the next blank. Right. And Cole Beasley is a purple unicorn like that dude there's a reason the bills brought him in when they did and paid him what they paid him i mean for three years he led the league in yards of separation which is a stat that curtis samuel actually had i think last year so he led the league in yards of separation by a little over three yards which is right around that cole beasley uh kind of like spot was i love shakir super excited for his role on this team i still think shakir is a three or a four guy uh, as far as kind of like in the depth chart, I don't find him necessarily being kind of like that go to more towards four that go to. I think if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be Diggs in the slot and it's going to be, you know, Curtis Samuel in the slot. But that's predicated upon the Bills drafting a number one wide receiver in this draft for the future. Right. So a guy that they're going to put on the outside and become that guy. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think I think who they want to replace Cole Beasley is Dalton Kincaid. And I think that's why they, I think that's why they drafted him. We saw how just how good he was mm-hmm. last year at getting to the heart of the defense, you know, sitting between the linebackers and the safeties and being that five, seven yard check down for Josh. It's a great take. It's a great take. Um and but I think Shakir is a like the perfect, perfect number three wide receiver mm-hmm. for this football team. We are miss we're missing He's not a number two. He does. He's not absolutely fantastic at anything. If he was a lineman, he would be. Um, oh my gosh! Now the guy that we just traded, right? He'd be Ryan Bates. No, Ryan Bates, opinion. yeah. Because because he's too. He's not great at anything, but he's good at everything. So yeah. I think Shakir is going to be the guy that gets you know four or five, six hundred yards, four or five touchdowns, and on about you know forty catches, just about every year for us. I mean, and Ronnie, you know how much I love Shakir. He was, our, I mean, he's been our guy that we have pounded the table for since, you know, he we drafted him. Uh, I, like Joe said, I think this is the year that rounds one or two, we take a wide receiver, like to start expanding that wide receiver one and come in to be the wide receiver two and, that, and sprinkle in Shakir in the three down set and then mix in Knox and Kincaid, depending on the package, like who, which of those two tight ends they'd rather have out there. Yeah. I think I saw a take on Twitter at one point in time. It was last week where they're like, you know, Stefan digs this Stefan digs that we have the next Stefan digs on the team. Look at Shakir. And they like put their numbers together. And I was like, Oh no, like let's, <laughs> can we not like Stefan digs, even in college coming into the pros, as much as he went in the fifth round was an elite route runner. I mean, Stefan digs yeah. wins on 80% of his routes in every level of the field, which is almost unheard of in the NFL. And that's at least 80. Some of the, some of the, the levels of the field, whether it's short, intermediate, or deep, he wins at a greater rate than 80%. Stefan is another world. And, and, you know, we all love Shakir, but he is not the route runner that Stefan digs is. Yeah. No. And like you just said, there's what, maybe three other guys in the NFL that are. So, right. you know, right. just, we got, I think that's where Bill's mafia, I mean, we jumped the gun. We were itching, 
for number two. All right, we had a great number one wide receiver. We saw the NFL start to go two wide receiver heavy, like two great mm-hmm. wide receivers heavy. Yep. Yep. We saw Gabe Davis flash his first two years behind Emmanuel Sanders and, and John Brown. Bill. Yep. And John Brown, and we were just, you know, we were we we're like, all right, this is it. You know, we got a we got a, a star in the making, and we everybody got our hopes up and expected more than I think was relatively, you know, consciously smart for Bills Mafia. Like we 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 all we jumped the gun on it and Again, he was a fifth round pick, you know, he for and for a reason. He wasn't expected to be a number two wide wide receiver, you know, especially mm-hmm. in his third year of the NFL. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the fact that we got as much use out of him as we did and he he turned it into getting paid, I, I think that's great for Gabe. But we just yeah. I I just don't want us to do that with Shaquille. I think I think that Bill's Mafia is like towing the line right now. Of pushing, of pushing the Shakir to number two again. Yeah. You guys know <laughs> how I feel about Khalil Shakir. I I watched him grow up here in Boise. Watched from the moment they recruited him and he signed on the you know national signing day. Uh, he became Boise State's number one guy. He became that guy that when you needed a catch and a first down, he was there. So the moment we drafted him, I w- I'll admit right now, I was one of those guys, oh, he's our number two for sure. He's going to be there. I guarantee it. <laughs> and I continued to pound that table. And, then, yeah, his rookie year didn't look so so great. Last year, if you watch from week one, I believe his snap share was like 10%, 9%, somewhere around there. And every single week, it increased a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. From, I think, week nine on, he had 39 receptions. What I'm saying that because Casey, what you just said that he's going to be that 40 reception, five, 600 yard guy every year. He was that last year in half a season, essentially. So I do expect more from him this year. Do I think he can be the number two guy? Uh, probably not. If I'm being honest with myself, because I don't think he has the physical traits to be that kind of guy. Do I think he could be one of become one of the better slot receivers in this game? I do think he could do that. Uh, but I, yeah, I don't think we have that number two guy on the roster right now. So he's like that. he's like number four in the slot on this on this roster right now. He's behind Delta Kincaid. He's behind Curtis Samuel. He's behind Stefan Diggs. Like he's the number four guy in the slot. Well, I, for me, I don't see Kincaid as the slot guy. I see him as the tight end, the tight end one. Um, I see at the current moment Samuel as the number two by default. I'm not by saying default, yeah, default. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you're right with the draft, which we're, we're going to talk about that here in a little bit because I do want to talk about it for sure. That's The wide receiver position seems to be like the prevalent Twitter talk right now. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's talking about that and who who they should get and what they should do and so on and so forth. But um, before we get to that, there was uh, – I posted up on Twitter earlier today – well, actually like an hour or two ago. But asking the question, because there's a lot of talk of some of the – defensive tackles in this draft and some of the the safeties and wide receivers those are some of the more uh, spoke about positions i guess so the question was what's your top five position needs right now for the bills as they head into the draft Mm -hmm. and uh, for me i don't remember what i put but i do remember i put defensive tackle at the top as number one because of age and because of depth i know that they just signed somebody new today something williams i can't remember the first name uh formerly i think with the broncos austin right was it Austin? Williams? No, that was Austin Johnson from Austin a few Johnson. days ago. That's right. Yeah, my bad. Yeah. Deshaun, yeah. Deshaun, Deshaun, Williams. Deshaun, Deshaun Williams. Deshaun, that's right. Deshaun Williams. Yes. Deshaun, Williams. Deshaun, Williams. Deshaun Williams. That one was Carolina. today. And from <clears throat> from what I hear about him, I don't. I just heard about that uh, today, so I haven't really had a chance to look into it. But it sounds like he's nothing more than kind of a reserve piece. But even with Austin Johnson coming in, they've re-signed Daquan Jones. But to me, that position needs to be looked at more so as. Uh, depth and and future because Daquan's what 33 I yeah. think yeah and um Austin Johnson I was mm, Deshaun, I, mean, uh, John, I think John late 20s yeah 29 he's like, yeah and okay. uh Deshaun is 31 so they're all in their um, pretty much almost in their 30s if not in their 30s so I we need that guy and uh, I know I've brought up the name, a couple of names at the defensive tackle position for the draft. But again, before we get into that, I want to hear from you guys. What do you think your position needs are uh, as far as, you know, your one through five on that? 
We'll I mean, go with uh, Mike on this one first. You, you got me. You got me sold right now on the defensive tackle uh, a thing. I didn't have that that high on my list. Um, safety stands out big big time to me, uh, and, and corner. Uh, so I have those two uh, hmm. one and one and two. Um, I know Joe's just talking about receivers and wanting to go there first in the draft and you know weighing out you know what <laughs> weighing out you know possible draft picks with what you need and and so that's kind of in the mix too but uh yeah I'm I'm saying safety because right as it sits right now Taylor Rapp is our our starting safety and I think it's uh yeah. you know let I, me I clarify though I'm not saying is positions based on where you would draft like first round needs to be this right position, right no round. just just in general so. Yeah, I I kind of think we're hurting his safety. I I don't know. I don't yeah, I don't know. It's weird cuz I wouldn't necessarily draft safety first either. Um but <laughs> I, I just feel like there's, there's holes there, you know, <laughs> still. Um way way too much value later in the draft and safety unless, this year. Unless you're yeah. drafting a generation right. of talent, you don't draft right. safety or center first. Right. first but round. obviously with with the Poyer and Hyde thing, I'm I'm still feeling, you know, the effects from that. So maybe, maybe that's just all that is. Uh... Roy here says defensive tackle, wide receiver, safety, corner, and offensive line. Uh, offensive line was on my list, as was tackle, wide receiver, safety. But my fifth position was, um... oh, my gosh. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Casey, what's yours? Well, I try to remember what I actually said. I can't remember. got to be said. edge, but go ahead, Casey. There you go. Edge. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's my number one. I think it's all that's, that's left. But. Yeah, right. Pretty much. Uh, Edge Edge is my number one. Um, we have two years, two years left of the group. Yeah, two years left of the group. Um, because Bean here, which they probably will. Bean's pretty much said he's going to. Um, yeah. But he's he hasn't exploded like we keep waiting on. Um, Year three, you know, that was supposed to be the big jump. That's usually the big jump for everybody under McDermott, and he just didn't really do that. Obviously, he is a phenomenal run defender, but it's starting to – he's had more sacks than Shaq Lawson had at this point in his career, but it's starting to kind of feel like a, another Shaq Lawson pick um, to where, you know, Shaq's, a, again, a great run defender on the edge. And he could throw in a sack here and there, but uh, he, it's just not consistent enough, especially for an, – and an, and you're picking up in the first round. I know picking – you know, we're picking late in the first, so it's more of an early – like the better uh, end of the second round guy we're getting, so they're not as much of the sure thing. But you'd still expect more out of him at this point. Um, so I – and we have AJ and Vaughn. But after them, I mean, we're, I mean, and uh, Kingsley Jonathan, who I'm hopeful for. I mean, I I think he's done well uh, rotationally for us so far. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind keeping him on the back end of the rotation, maybe making him defensive end four. But I still think that we need to keep planning for the future because there's only one more year guaranteed with Von Miller on this team. After that, all the rest of his contract becomes voided, or we can't we can well, cut there's... him and it not and it not kill us. So I think that's a place question that works for Miller too. So that we need. So that's a position that I really think that we need to make uh, a splat, not a splash, but draft this year. And I would say in the top three rounds. Yeah, yeah. I I, I feel like we're circling it, and I think you could take the defensive tackle and the defensive end conversation and just pile it into DL. Right. The question yeah. is: is yeah. what are you taking and where? Who are the Bills? You know, who are they going to be when they grow up? Uh, I've said for several years and been proven right for several years. The Bills have, I don't know how many years running it's been, have had more money invested in the defensive line. Last year might have been the difference just because they had several, like just one or two million dollar guys in there. Uh, and they want to do this like 50 to 60 percent rotation or 40 to 50 percent rotation thing. And it just hasn't worked. Um, it's great that your guys are rested they're not getting to the quarterback. It's great that your guys are rested. They're not really stopping the run. Like they're, we got to, they're going to have to figure that out. Like you've got Daquan Jones, you've got Ed Oliver. What is wrong with playing them 80% of the snaps? Like every other football team does in the national football league, including like Chris Jones who wins super bowls, like let him just let him play 85% of the snaps, roll, roll some guys in when they get tired and need a spell. If there's an 11 minute drive or a nine minute drive, but 
positions of need is such a fun conversation um, mm -hmm. because it literally turns into who, where, when, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, right. Yeah. It and changes. I'm not, yeah, it changes. And I'm not necessarily sure that I'm sold on the idea of Connor McGovern moving to center. I don't know that the bills are necessarily sold on that idea either. Will clap is a fun conversation being, uh, I was driving to, I was driving to Toronto on Tuesday and I called Spence just because I had some windshield time and we hadn't chatted in a couple of days. And I was, we were just talking about like, will clap and it, will clap is like, Oh, well, the bill signed a free agent, you know, offensive line guy. The Bills do that every year, and we get really excited about the fact that they do that. And every year, the guy gets cut and doesn't make the football team. It's like, what? So does this guy matter? You know what I mean? Like, is he really? Is he just camp fodder? I think we, I think we've nailed it. Defensive line, wide receiver, safety, cornerback, offensive line. The question is who, when, where. I feel like the Bills have this real good cadence in the NFL too of finding dudes on the couch, Lenville Joseph, and mm -hmm. bringing Puna Ford. Here's a million bucks. Come play for Josh or come play with Josh Allen. Yeah. And that's like, what I'm saying. Safety or corner at my top two because right now we I haven't that, done I that think yet. Corner is towards the bottom for me. The Bills, yeah, they can just they can throw you in there, Mike, at corner, and you're gonna play well. <laughs> like it just, it just have safety, you seen Mike? <laughs> I'm not I'm not so sure about safety. There was a great point that Matt Perino made, which was if it was so easy to play safety in this defense, the Bills would have replaced Hyde and, and uh, Poyer a long time ago like, and not given them bigger contracts. Like, it's yeah. not that simple. Corner, on the other hand, it just seems like put a helmet on a guy cover, and throw him out yeah. there. Co <laughs> and cover over top. Eight corner right. for the Bills is basically keep the guy in front of you. That's exactly right. That's what, If you remember, and you all do, we all were so mad at Levi Wallace. And then finally, somebody that was smarter than us said, he's it was Mookie Hawkins, he's doing exactly what they want him to do. Just keep the play in front of him, make the tackle. Yep. That's what they want yep. him to do. And it's like, Oh, well, if that's the assignment and then John Fiena said the same thing, it's like, Oh, if that's what they want, then he's doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, they yeah. have a track record. Wallace Jackson, Benford, late round guys that Tons didn't have played well. Um, my brain is so mush right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was up for 38 hours yesterday and dealing with, you know, everything. So I'm trying to catch up. My, my mental fog thing is <laughs> still there. <laughs> but um, I, first of all, Mike, Casey, what have I been saying for as long as we've been doing the show about that rotation? Oh, yeah. yeah I've, been, it's an over I've been waiting for, for it. Yeah, I've been waiting for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know I hate it. I hate it. Yeah. Um, they – because I – we hear about McDermott and everybody always talk about your best 11, your best 11. Well, why do you keep taking the best 11 off the field mm. every, you know, couple of snaps? You should email him so, that. That's good. <laughs> Let me just get on the phone. <laughs> That's, good. Here. <laughs> That's good. That was, that was good. <laughs> but I, so yeah, corner for me isn't on there, but let's kind of transition because we've already kind of brought up the, the draft. Um, there are people out there, the fans, that are it's wide receiver or bust for them mm -hmm. and i don't want to put words in your mouth joe but it almost sounds like that's kind of where you are but i'll let you elaborate on it but we know bean is more about the best player available this and that i personally think he's going to probably move up in this draft i mean that's you know that's not a hot that's what he does stretch of imagination. that's what yeah. he does right I, yeah, to, me, to me, to me, Sean McDermott, if, if Sean McDermott and Spence and I have laughed about this before, if Sean McDermott is smart, he's going to call Mike Tomlin and say, hey, Mike, what are you taking in the first round? Is it a wide receiver? And more than likely, Mike Tomlin's not taking a wide receiver in the first round. And, these, and then he should say, give me your top five wide receivers because Mike Tomlin can draft wide receivers. That dude played wide receiver in college, and that dude can draft wide receivers like nobody else can. Like, think of the guys that that dude has just brought in as rookies yeah. and second year players and just exploded moving up. Doesn't it doesn't wouldn't surprise me at all. Do they move up and get the right guy? I don't know. Is the right guy at 28 is the right guy earlier than that is the right guy later than that. I I'm not a draft Nick. I don't know. And to me, the draft is a crap shoot literally darts out of dartboard blindfolded. I don't care what anybody says. There's very few players that come into the league in college where you're like, Oh my God, that guy. Let's pick one. Andrew Luck. You know who wasn't? Stefan Diggs. You know who wasn't? Aaron Donald. Like, there's a lot of guys that are generational talents and players that, like, guys missed on for rounds and rounds, right? And then there's other dudes that it's like, that's the guy, and then he's a bust. Uh, uh, Jamar, I was going to say Jamarcus Russell. Traylon Burks. 
right? I mean, the freaking yep. Tennessee yep. Titans moved AJ Brown for Traylon Burks. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> and now the general manager's fired, right? It's like, yeah, can you, I, have, you have that up big time. <laughs> can I just say that when they drafted Traylon Burks, I called it right off the bat because the second that they, the first rookie mini camp he had, like he couldn't participate participate because he didn't have his inhaler i was like that is not the kind of football player i want on my team and that is coming from somebody that who has asthma but literally was like, Tra- uh-uh. <laughs> Traylon burks the tennessee titans got fooled uh basically it was the uh the todd collins thing like Traylon burks looks like aj brown he, he runs like aj brown he's built like aj aj brown he must be aj brown and if you're not you guys aren't old enough but ronnie is like that's what we were told about todd collins He's as big as Jim Kelly. He looks like Jim Kelly. He throws like Jim Kelly. Guess what? Todd <laughs> Collins was not Jim Kelly. Not even remotely. <laughs> not even remotely close. Um, and that was, yeah, the, the beginning of the downfall for the Bills, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So there's so what would you go ahead. what would you do, Joe, if you were Brandon Bean? And what would your plan be in attacking this draft? You clearly, the hard part is like, you're not supposed to draft for need and the Buffalo bills always draft for need. They tell you they don't, well, we're going to look at our board and we're going to see who's the best up there and blah, 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 blah. And then they draft for need. It's like, then they reach and go get a guy. They do it in the middle rounds all the time. The the other issue is the bills aren't very good in one or two. Like they're like their, their scouting department and, and their guys are great three to six, right? Like they just, they nail those dudes. Maybe you just, somebody says let's embrace that and let's i think ronnie said like get out of the first round i don't even know i you just you've got to find the bills are in a position they were last year too the bills are in a position right now where kansas city was two years ago they got to enter this draft and they got to find seven guys that are going to play period they can't draft seven guys and three of them make the team and barely play they got to draft six or seven guys that are going to play significant snaps next year where those guys play, who cares? Just go get them and then fill in the holes, right? And that's kind of what I was saying before. Even before they, they let uh, Jordan Poyer and all those other guys go, I was saying before that, that it's time to kind of like cut some ties, move forward, and almost revamp that defense with some new, fresh, young blood and lean into the rookie class this year and mm-hmm. let those guys you know, learn by fire, basically. Um, I, I would not have an issue with the bills trading back. Like you were just saying, Joe, um, is especially because the one, as far as receivers goes, the one name that I keep bringing up that I sometimes get a lot of crap for on Twitter is Lab McConkie. And everybody's like, well, he's not an X guy. Well, I don't, I don't really care what the player looks like. Is he a good route runner? Can he get separation and can he catch the ball? That's all I really care about the whole I, I, this isn't my grandfather's NFL anymore. We don't need the big, huge receivers, and it, it's just it's positionless, t- right? You don't. Same but thing I think I said it last we week, though. About. I want a running back who I don't need a power back. I don't need a third down back. I don't need a first and second down back. I want a guy that can do all of it because they, you know, the offense can be more versatile with that, less predictable. If you've got a, a McConkey, a Diggs, and a Shakir out there, and a Samuel. Throwing Kincaid and Cooks, those guys can go all over the place. There's no one position that they wouldn't be able to play. And I mean, McCarthy but they have still a four three nine guy. They have to understand the concept of the offense, and the concept of the yeah. Bills' offense is not simple. Even with Dayball being gone, and it going through iterations of Ken Dorsey, and then an iteration of Joe Brady, it's still. And again, I'm friends with Isaiah Hodgins, right? Um, he would tell you that it's one of the most difficult offenses in the NFL. And it's not so much because of the concepts and the schemes as much as it is backyard football. And I think that's what Josh Allen has been missing. He's been missing guys that are going to go to where he's, his mind thinks they should go. So when he releases the ball, they end up there. So just, and I think that's the biggest jump or the biggest hurdle as it pertains to drafting wide receivers right now is, you know, you got to find a guy that's going to be able to meld into this system versus a system guy. Right. Does that yeah. make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, Mike, with McConkey, I, I think, I, I, I don't know. I just, I hear this. the name a lot, dude. I, I'm not a draft Nick. Yeah. I hear the name yeah. a lot. It seems like that's where a lot of people are. <laughs> yeah. What I'm and stuck on people aren't. with the receiver thing in, in the, you know, you're saying it's not the same, you know, football these days, but 
I, I still like to think when we're if we're in a Hail Mary situation, I need a big target there to to, to go up and get it. Well, you've got it, Dalton Kincaid. You've got a guy. Do. Got, yeah. Catch. I mean, what's the, Buff- the Buffalo to have Bills- one more of them though? Well, Justin Shorter, Justin Shorter is on the, the team as well. Um, and Collins Buffalo- is six four. Yeah, the statement that was made la- in last year's draft that that everybody seems to have, have forgotten is the Buffalo Bills catch rate in twenty twenty two was awful. It was downright mm-hmm. putrid. Uh, a big like problem was Gabe Davis, and he was a problem last year as well. Yeah. The Bills then went and got Dalton Kincaid, who was the best pass catching tight end. They went and got Justin Shorter, who had a catch rate of ninety seven percent. Like they went and got guys that could catch the freaking football. Justin Shorter didn't play, but you obviously saw what Dalton Kincaid, Kincaid could do. So mm. I, I feel I feel like they're answering some of those things, right? Getting guys that can catch the football. I just I'm not sold that the guys that they necessarily have can play backyard football the way that Josh, Stephon Diggs can, Cole Beasley could, Emmanuel Sanders and John Brown could. I I don't know. Shakir seems to be getting there. We'll see if Samuel can. I think there's just something there's just something missing from that offense, right? And I feel mm-hmm. I feel like that's what it is. Like they want who was it? Uh, uh, I can't remember who the guy was. It's uh, it's oh, uh, there's a dude that was on with John and Jerry last year, and he basically said if you're wanting to put Josh Allen in structure and be a precision quarterback, you're doing the wrong thing. That's not who he is. Like he is, he can throw, he can throw with accuracy and he can put the ball where he wants, but he is not a structure quarterback. He ha- he has to, and we see it and we love it. Right? That's what we love mm-hmm. about him because as soon as he breaks the pocket, you're like yes, like <laughs> like that's where you want him to be <laughs> yeah. outside the pocket. He's just not a – he's not Kirk Cousins. Like, that's just not who he is. There's a couple of comments here. Uh, first of all, I want to bring up one from Roy. Uh, but is Brady's system different from before? Do you uh, – Casey, I'll start with you on this question. Do you think this offense is going to be uh, that much different? Because we've heard, like Joe was just saying, that this offense is tough to learn. Uh, Neheim Hines said it when we first signed him. And there was somebody else, too, that I can't remember who it was. It, it had – you know, reference that. There's one of the newer Do you think that maybe Brady sees that and maybe he dumbs it down, for lack of a better word, or are we going to see more of the same just with a little bit of his flavor to it? I think we're going to see more of just his flavor to it. Um, the only receiver so far, or well, there's two, Matt Collins uh, coming in and Curtis Samuel. So those are the only two bo- bodies coming in that have zero idea of what the offense, you know, looks like structurally. I we saw when Brady took over, there was a little bit more motion. You know, we we were seeing Diggs being put in the backfield. We were seeing Shakir and Knox being put in the backfield. Um, we saw little wrinkles. I expect to see more of that, and I think that's where Curtis Samuel plays in. Um, I think that he is like Joe. I think he is Joe Brady's wrinkle for this year. I think he's <laughs> like there's going to be. I think he's going to be, you know, specifically targeted in certain uh, downs yeah. and packages and. Um, I like they. I think they brought him in for a reason. So that that's what I see uh, more so for this offense. I like that. I'm thinking like use him, and then now we can let Diggs be Diggs instead of forcing those, you know, bubble screens and short passes. Yeah, agreed. I just Diggs is not was not good at that. He was not, in my opinion, good with the ball in his hands and the out of the backfield. Some of those runs that they did with him just right. To me, yeah, get him out of there and put him back out of the receiver, yeah. whether it's on the outsider in the slot or whatever, but yeah, I let him do his thing and not try to. Do it's interesting different. because through the first eight games, and I don't know if you guys saw it, but he, he actually referenced it in one of his Super Bowl uh, radio row conversations. He said through the first eight games, I was having a career season. Then all of a sudden things changed and it's, and, and yeah. Bill Mafia wants to blame Stefan Diggs. Well, he completely vanished in the second half of the season. And it's like, are you sure that's a Stefan Diggs thing? Or right. is that a team thing? <laughs> is that a he Joe Brady being- thing? Right, so he was being asked to do multiple different things that he isn't used to doing. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't ever remember him lining up the backfield or being put in the slot nearly as much as he was last year. Moved and moved around pre-snap. So, and again, I I feel like a broken desk here. Like I think that's where they brought in Curtis Samuel, like Mike said. I I, th- I think that they just back in our day that was a broken record. <laughs> yeah, yeah he's too young to know what records are. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no. um, I couldn't think of it. Um, <laughs> it's still technically it's a disc, so you're not yeah, wrong. It still works. Yeah, I'm back, bro. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, at least one. At least I respect one of my elders. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I th- I think that's 
again, that's why they brought, brought in Curtis Samuel. They want him, they want Diggs to be Diggs to get back to doing what he was doing. And everything that they had him doing last time was, or end of last season was just out of character, out of, you know, out of perspective for him. And he just, it just wasn't working. So I think they brought in Curtis Samuel to do all those things and just let Diggs go wild on the outside again. The only thing that I'll add to that, I'll be the grumpy old guy that's that anti digs in this conversation, but it, the, 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 the targets were still there. They were not quite as high as they were the first half of the season, but he was still being targeted more than any receiver on the team. Uh, he had a lot more drops. He led the team in drops. I, I don't have the answer. I don't know what the issue was. I don't know if it was just Brady. I don't know if there was some lingering injury that he wasn't talking about. I don't believe that was the case. I mean, I don't think you're going to hand the ball off to him in the backfield and have him run through the offensive line if he's got an injury that he's nursing. But I think that happened once. There was something up. <laughs> I think it happened once. Yeah. It's not like they did that every game a bunch of times. He wasn't Debo Samuel no. when he got out there. Right. <laughs> Definitely not Debo. But I, I am confident that this year will be different. I don't think it's an age thing. I don't think anything like that. I don't think he's hit that wall where he he's on not. decline he's not. at all. But, um, yeah, that's just that's my thing with Diggs. I th- I think I was more frustrated with him probably than a lot of people. Well, maybe not a lot of people, but at least these two guys here, Mike and Casey. But uh, the biggest problem Stephon yeah. Diggs had last year was there was no number two. Like it's and it was a it was a lingering problem cool. from twenty twenty two. I mean there was Gabe Davis didn't scare anybody, especially when he vanishes for four games, you know, in a row. Like Stephon Diggs was they were they were locking him down and therefore it was putting him in a position where the only routes he could run were underneath routes where there was a dude or two draped on him which Stefan Diggs is an incredible contested catch receiver but how many how many times can you go to the well and ask him to catch them all right yeah. um so I, I think it's it's fun to to scapegoat him a little bit um I don't think it's valid that's just me but I mean, get him, Joe. I, I do get think him. he'll be back next year. <laughs> I, I'm not concerned, none the least, about him going into next season. Um, but speaking of Diggs, because we were talking about Lad McConkey a while ago, and and how you mentioned a while ago that uh, Stefan Diggs coming out of college, he was not a guy. Like everybody's like, oh, that's Diggs guy, whatever. Uh, if you put up, and I pulled this up earlier, but if you put up uh, Diggs pre-draft scouting report from NFL.com mm-hmm. and put it next to Lad McConkey, they're just saying the exact same things. Let's McConkey. not do this. Let's not do this, yeah. Ron. <laughs> I'm not, not comparing him and saying he's the next Diggs. I'm just for all those people that oh, say that man. he can't play on the outside or he's not an X receiver. <laughs> Lad can do it. Just I'm, I'm going to get off on that hill for a minute. On, the, <laughs> on that, I think we should let Joe get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a good time. I pre- so literally, so I, I, I haven't about. done anything uh, since uh, the last. I think I skipped the last playoff game, and then I did, a sh- I did a show after that, like a week after or something like that, because a bunch of people were mad that they didn't get to spend that time with me. They were like, you know, I had no <laughs> place. You you vent for me, and it's like I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So this has been fun. I appreciate the invite a lot. It's. I haven't talked a whole lot of Bills football. I've been traveling a bunch and really not paying a whole lot of attention. I'm excited for the draft, but uh, thank you guys for having me. This has been a trip. Yeah, Appreciate it, man. If, We're glad to have if you. If you get the edge to talk, let us know. Oh, yeah. no, way. and it, So Thursdays can generally be tough for me, but, yeah, I mean, if you need, I don't know, a dude with a deep voice, an, an old guy <laughs> that also has gray in his beard along with Ron, then, you, you, yeah, you need a guy to fill some time. I can I – can, I can't talk as long. I can't monologue as long as Bruce Nolan can. I don't know if you've had Bruce on your yeah. show, but that dude. Maybe maybe some uh, but yeah. ad reads or some uh, intro stuff or something like that. I do a lot of that <laughs> stuff. Yeah, <laughs> you were watching the Mafia Cast well, live, you. brought to you by Game On Sports and the Buffalo Rumblings Vidcast Network. Yeah, I love it. Oh my, that love sounds it. like oh an audition right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, uh, all right. We'll have to keep you coming on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Appreciate you, fellas. Uh, yeah. So, for everybody paying attention to me, I don't know when I'm going to be coming back. There's conversation around me and John coming back April 1st, uh, doing some more stuff on the overreaction side as far as the. So, most people don't know this. I haven't, Spence and I have a network, the overreaction network that we don't, we, we broadcast to it from rumblings, but we don't really do a whole lot on it. I did some stuff last year. So, there's some talk about doing some of that through the offseason. 
And then I'm not necessarily sure what the, the regular season is going to bring either. But uh, yeah, the, the, I'm looking forward to football. Or I miss it. So I'm ready. I'm ready for football to be back. Right. So, yeah. Thank, mm-hmm. Thanks for thanks for uh, giving me some energy, fellas. Appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. No little problem. little, little crack. Co- yeah. Crack cocaine in the veins. Right. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go Bills, guys. Go Bills. All right. Go Bills, Go Bills buddy. <laughs> All right. Red and blue in the veins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So there was this, another. We talked about the defensive tackle a bit. What do we even have right now, as far as defensive uh, tackle? Yeah, we so we talked about Curtis Samuel. We I'm trying four. to get caught up. We and have. Uh, like, so I'm looking at the depth chart right just... now. We have uh, Daquan Jones and Ed Oliver, and then uh, our two new additions, Williams and Johnson, That's and it. Anquo Eli Anquo um, is the fifth there. For D tackles, oh, that's yeah, what you're. That's that. what you're looking for. Is that, I okay? Maybe maybe he is uh, a defensive tackle. I'm trying to remember. I, I was thinking he was an end, but maybe he was one of those guys who could go either either way. Is there? Are, are you the two of you? Are you all about? Are you wide receiver or bust in round one? Uh, I'm. I'm kind of kind of settling. On the thought of best available, I know there's a lot of receiver talent. I mean, if there is uh, one of the few guys I'm, I think of when I think of wide receiver in the first round for the Bills, um, if they're available, I'd say get them. But there's a lot of – I mean, K- Casey mentioned edge is a, a big need, and I know I kind of mentioned my needs were like defensive back, but as far as the draft goes, you know, I'm definitely looking defensive lineman too, so there's a lot of – a lot of good edge players that could go early um, that I could see us grabbing as well. As far as trading back and trading up, I, I'd rather see us trade back than trade up at this point, unless there's someone you're really, really into uh, for some reason. So yeah, no, I like I like quantity over quality, you know, so to speak, with this draft. And, and I think the Bills have enough needs where the pressure isn't on um, to have to go and get that one guy, and, and we kind of can – evaluate what's there and pick you know maybe the best available player whether it's receiver yeah. uh d lineman or all right maybe even a defensive back but i've i've done a few mocks where i've, I've been taking safeties third round and, and been happy with it um but like joe said you know who's to say how, how their career ends up in the in the nfl yeah and i, I want to elaborate really quick on what you just said as far as quantity over quality i i don't like the the point of that would be like Joe was talking about throwing darts, the more darts you have, the mm-hmm. most more likely you are to hit the target, right? So I, I think that's kind of the, the point of that idea. And I I tend to agree. I think this draft is a deep, deep draft. I've heard some people refer to this as the COVID draft because there's a lot of like fifth year seniors in it. So we're starting oh, really? to see wow. all those guys from 2020 that took that extra year that the uh, NCAA afforded them of eligibility. Now we're seeing those guys, and I think that's one reason why this class is so deep. There are some positions mm. that aren't quite at that level, like safety, I think, isn't that deep. There's a couple of guys in the two to three third round range. Um, but Casey, what do you think? Are you are you one of those wide receivers, or or I'm going to be mad kind of guys? No, in the first round. No. So well, so I'm team wide receiver in the first round for basically one guy if he's there between 25 and 28 and that's Brian Thomas I, I like I just he has all the makings like it's like when we were looking at Josh Allen who's coming out of the draft he has every intangible that you could want from a quarterback you know it's just he's just not a finished product and I think that's what Brian Thomas is and could be. He has every single intangible. Um, you get him in a room with Diggs, you know, somebody who's a leader the way he is and how much and how much he works with the other receivers. Um, I don't think Gay would have been as good of a receiver as he was if he didn't have somebody like Diggs to learn behind. Same with Shakir. I think he helped with their developments immensely. But if neither of those guys are there, I mean, if he's not there at, you know, somewhere around 25, then I think it's, you know, trade back to somebody in in the early 30s. There's always somebody that in the early second round that wants to bump 
back up and end of the first and get one of the guys, you know, whether it be somebody like a Michael Penix or a Bo Nix, um, get somebody going up and trying to get like getting a quarterback that can sit for a year or two and truly learn behind somebody, someone like the Raiders, I could see wanting to trade back up with us. So then I would be team. I'm 100% team trade back, grab someone like Ladd McConkey, Xavier Leggett, and then we're either going to get, you know, maybe a second, another second, or uh, recoup a third. And then we have, you know, then we're back to square one. We have all the same, like, we got, we still got our first round pick, basically, and additional picks, because we still got the wide, a very, very good wide receiver, and let's say it's McConkey. But now we have somebody that we can take, maybe a Javon Bullard, uh, or a Cam Kitchens at safety, someone like a Brandon Fisk at defensive tackle, Ruko Horohoro, uh, defensive tackle out of Clemson, um, Demarcus Robinson, defensive end out of Missouri. He's an absolute monster. He's built like Groot. So, I mean, I, w- I wouldn't, you know, with, with Groot uh, coming to the end, starting to come to the end, end of his contract, I wouldn't mind seeing them uh, go that route. Tyler Newbin, another safety out of Minnesota. Ron, I know you've been a big fan of him lately. Um, I, I think, I think I'm, unless Brian Thompson is there, I'm 100% team trade back into the second and have three, three to four picks out of the top four rounds. And, and instead of like Mike said, going quantity over quality, it's going quantity over quality, but more so at a targeted rate, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that'd be a solid pick. I'd be happy with that with Brian Thomas. Yeah. I don't know what it is with Brian Thomas Jr. For me, I just, it makes me nervous for some reason. Uh, A lot of times when you have players that suddenly show up on everybody's radar because of their combine performance, they instantly become, Oh my gosh, everybody needs this guy. He has the production. He, you know, he was a good player. And I don't get, don't get me wrong. He's not just a combine guy, but I just, I have a nervous feeling about him for some reason. I can't explain. It. I can't put my finger on it. They're uh, butterflies, the Ronnie. Exact opposite. You're gonna love it. <laughs> and I feel the exact <laughs> opposite with McConkey. Yeah. And the one thing that stands out for me about McConkey that I keep reading about is two things: his 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 desire, his work ethic, and his route running. Uh, I've seen some kind of scouting reports to talk about him as the best route running among the receivers in this draft, more so than Marvin Harrison Jr., Neighbors, or Odunze. And to me, yes, you can get better at the route tree, but if you come into the league and that's already your main strength, that's huge, huge, because then you can just focus on learning the offense. You know how to run the routes. You're good at it. You already have 4-3-9 speed because you can't obviously coach speed. And I know Brian Thomas, I think, had a 4 3 one or two or something like that. So he's a little bit faster, but four, three, nine, that can still get up, feel pretty dang quick. Mm. So uh, that's where I'm at with that. Another one defensive tackle that we can get around the fourth round is Christian Boyd out of Northern Illinois. That's another player I'm falling in love with. If you want to call it a, a man crush, by all means call it that. I love this kid. And I, he's another one, high motor, doesn't stop, uh, relentless pursuit. Those are some of the key words that I, I, I read with his scouting reports. And but then and then I agree with what you're saying, Casey. Let's take that first pick, drop back into the early second. You you can probably still going to get a, a Troy Franklin or a McConkey or one of those guys. You add an extra second or third round, and then you use because the bulk of these eleven picks are in the last three rounds. So use some of those to get up a little higher. So your 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 uh, main part of this draft is between rounds two and and five. If you can do that and still pull in eight nine picks. That to me is it would be the perfect draft. So trade Agreed. back and then trade back yeah. up again. Agreed. Yeah, trade back I one one hundred percent. Like I said, like tar like targeted. Mm-hmm. Right, and you know, and I'm just going to throw this out there, and maybe this isn't a popular opinion or or whatever, but we always hear about the best player available, right? I have a hard time believing that GMs and coaches go into a draft and like. Well, this guy's the number one on our draft board. We're taking him. Well, you already have a franchise quarterback. Well, yeah, but he's the best player available. <laughs> it's, I, I just think that there's, to me, when you talk about best player available, and I think somebody mentioned in the comments a while ago, best player available 
at a need. So mm-hmm. if you've if you've got four guys around your value where you think they should be, you're going to draft for the need. You're going to look at that four guys and like, well, yeah, this guy's probably the best of this four, but the third best of this four answers a need that we have. So it, to me, it's a combination. It's not just strictly best available. Mm-hmm. But there's so many wide widespread of needs that it <laughs> – it's, it's like best stop. available. Like <laughs> people like to talk about, we're not playing I, Madden here, and I we're don't. not. But when I draft on Madden, you damn right, I'm drafting for need. <laughs> That's how <laughs> I do it, and I win mainly because I'm controlling it and I'm good at it. But <laughs> <laughs> it's easier than running. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever happens in Madden is real life, right? Like, come yeah. on. Speaking of, speaking of which, when you get home, we need to have a Madden game. <laughs> Ronnie and I have known each other for almost three years now and have been playing Madden the same amount of time, obviously, and have never played each other because he's a PS5 nerd and I'm an Xbox <laughs> nerd. But I just got the new Xbox, so now that we're cross plan, Ronnie and I need to make something work. We'll live stream maybe it. We, I was say maybe we can even stream it and come up with some sort of bet. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, oh, I'll commentate geez. in the bottom corner or something. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That'd be perfect. We'll get it going. You that would be nuts. perfect. You know how I feel about that. So let's go through some of these comments here really quick because we're we're at an hour. But uh, there were some other ones up here. Uh, Claude, I can't pronounce the last name, but P-U-I-S. He said something about Samuel being basically McKenzie, only better. And when I was listening to Joe talk about uh, Curtis Samuel and his, and his thoughts on him. That's exactly what was going through my mind was Curtis Samuel is just a better version of Isaiah McKenzie, and I think that's how they're going to use him. And right now we have 666 viewers. Okay, thank you. Somebody dropped off. So now I, I didn't like seeing that number on my screen. Just hanging there for a second. <laughs> you guys know. are talking about the devil Madden. I know, right? Um, but so I, I agree with what Claude was saying as far as that. He also mentioned – uh, please stop talking about Justin Shorter because we don't know, and that's absolutely correct. There's a lot of Justin Shorter fans out there. I don't know why. He's not mm-hmm. done anything yet to make anybody think that he's going to be – even make the team for that matter, right. right? Maybe he's a number two receiver. We don't know. But uh, it's interesting that there are so many people out there that think he's the next great thing and why I don't know. Can you guys explain that? Because he's built like DK Metcalf. <laughs> well, I'd say Matt yeah, Collins he's... has a big of a shot as uh, Shorter does to be a play a part in the offense this year. Yeah, so. that's how I see it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Uh, if you are listening on YouTube, uh, please hit the like button and subscribe to the Buffalo Lowdown YouTube channel. We also have our own YouTube channel. At the whoa, 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 whoa. The what? Buffalo Rumblings network not That's the buffalo lowdown no oh lowdown buffalo, no other site buffalo buffalo lowdown. Rumblings. okay if i didn't say rumblings my bad buffalo rumblings <laughs> network i write for lowdown so that's different but, here it is um yeah hit the like hit the subscribe for for both the youtube channels also you can find us over on facebook at the mafia cast if you're listening there hit the like share subscribe to our channel uh our page i guess it's called there but um, yeah, so we're going to get out of here. Do you guys have any last things you want to throw in? Any last comments about the oh, oh, next week? We're going to do a live mock draft on the show. So oh, yeah. be, come be a part of that. We, we'd love to hear people's inputs. And what, basically what we're going to do is each pick, we'll kind of discuss what we want to do with it, whether it's we may do some trades. But we also want the input from the fans and the comments. And so um, if you have a good point or maybe the three of us can't make a decision and we'll leave it up to the fans to decide for us. So be part of that. Uh, you guys you got might even run a few of them this off season, right? Before draft time. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, another another fun interactive way to get involved in the show. Again, we appreciate all you guys. And yeah, I don't got much much else to add. Yeah, and we need we need to come up with a contest, some yeah. sort of a contest giveaway that involves mock drafts. Yeah. And next week, we have John on the show, and we'll okay. be doing our next giveaway next week. So right. maybe we can do a thing to where if someone if someone predicts what we do, but in the first round, so say whether they pick the right player or whether we trade up or trade back. See, the way maybe. that I've done 
a giveaway in the past. When I first started doing podcasts, we had fans uh, email their first round mock picks one through 32. And for each pick, if you get the position right, you get a point. If you get the player right, it's a point and so on. Um, and then if the team was right, because, you know, sometimes teams trade out. And then so we did it that way. But we'll we'll come up with something uh, that's next month. Like uh, Casey said, next week we'll have John, our, our uh, the owner of on, a Game on Sports will be with us. So he'll be part of the, the, the mock draft. So it's going to be a good time. I know. We're going to get out of here, and we'll see you all next week. Go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Tell your friends. Hey, it's John from Game On Sports Memorabilia. Check out our huge selection of unopened wax boxes of Pokemon cards. You have to see our selection of over 2 million sports cards in stock, plus hard-to-find card supplies. And if you have anything to sell, bring it in. We can help you determine the true value before you sell it. We pay fair market value every day. It's Game On Sports Memorabilia, 2670 Dewey Avenue in Greece. Check out our podcast for news and information on the card and collectible universe. Also, check out our Facebook page. For more, call 481-2153. That's 481 481- 2153.